on this Thursday night facing up to Alberta's crisis. The premier finally admits mistakes, reverses course and reimposes restrictions. We must deal with the reality that we are facing. We cannot wish it away. As more Albertans die, can Jason Kenney survive politically? What's riding on the 905, the vast and volatile swath of voters in Ontario? The paternity results are in. Did Canada's former top soldier father a child with a subordinate? A Global News exclusive. And pushed to the brink. It was not uncommon that I would see someone who was dying and an end of life in the hallway. We take you inside Brampton's only hospital. Global National with Donna Friesen. We are in Brampton, Ontario tonight, a rapidly growing city that's in a part of the province all the federal parties covet. Not only are there millions of potential votes in this region, it's politically volatile. Many voters switch parties. In 2011, people here helped elect a Tory majority, and then in 2015, they swung left, helping Justin Trudeau win his majority. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight in Alberta, where Premier Jason Kenney is finally dealing with a COVID-19 crisis that he's ignored and denied for months. In July, Kenney declared the pandemic over, removed public health restrictions, and pretty well disappeared from view. Despite multiple warnings, the fourth wave was coming. Well, now it has hit with deadly force. Ten more deaths were reported in Alberta today. 896 people are now in the hospital. 222 of them are in intensive care. Alberta Health Services announced today it is cancelling all scheduled surgeries in that province. And Ontario has offered to accept ICU patients from Alberta. Much of this was preventable. Last night, Premier Kenny apologized for moving too quickly to declare the pandemic over, but he didn't apologize for lifting almost all the public health restrictions in early July. Now those restrictions are back. A vaccine passport system is being put in place, and it's certain more Albertans will die before those things have an impact. Heather Urex West has our top story tonight. 11 weeks after removing all public health restrictions, Alberta's open summer has come to an abrupt end. We may run out of staffed intensive care beds within the next 10 days. Facing a crisis in Alberta hospitals that could no longer be ignored, the Premier introduced broad new public health measures Wednesday. Alberta will no longer be wide open this fall. There are new restrictions on indoor social gatherings and for businesses. Unless they opt into the restriction exemption program, Alberta's version of the vaccine passport, the Premier offered an apology of sorts. I apologize for uh, having uh, embraced the uh, a public shift from pandemic to endemic, which was clearly uh, premature. But don't apologize for having lifted public health restrictions in our open for summer uh, plan. But a summer without any restrictions has led Alberta into a crisis doctors have been trying to prevent. Former Alberta Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. James Talbot, says even with these measures, it's likely Alberta doctors will have to implement critical care triage protocols, ultimately deciding who will live and die. The people who are going to have to make those decisions are going to be haunted by them for the rest of their lives because they're going to have to face up with two things. Two, th two things. One, they had to make the choice, and two, it was completely preventable. Preventable, he says, if those in power had been listening. One of the truly troubling things that happened in the province was that the premier and some of his closest advisors were publicly sneering at Albertans who were trying to raise issues of public health. A senior staff member in the premier's office tweeted in early June, the pandemic is ending, accept it. Now on the brink of a health care disaster, the Alberta government has accepted that was wrong. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. The pandemic is not over, and what's happening in Alberta puts it front and center days before the federal election. Abigail Beeman is traveling with the Liberal campaign. Abigail? Donna, Justin Trudeau called the situation in Alberta heartbreaking, and while he held back from directly slamming Premier Jason Kenney, he used the opportunity to take swipes at Aaron O'Toole and broadly conservative government's handling of the pandemic. And that's at the heart of the choice Canadians need to make in this election. Because just a few days ago, Mr. O'Toole was still applauding Mr. Kenny for his management of the pandemic. 
Trudeau said he reached out to the clerk of the Privy Council to talk about supports for Alberta, and he said ventilators are now on the way to the province and Ottawa will be there to help. Trudeau was also asked about his contradictory message. He literally tells people to vote Liberal to, quote, end the pandemic, at the same time as saying it's not his job to interfere with the provinces and their decisions. The closest Trudeau came to criticizing Alberta directly was to say if they had signed on to vaccine passports sooner, things might be better right now. Donna? All right, Abigail in Quebec, thank you. Well, the Liberals have tried to link Jason Kenney to federal Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole, who has praised Kenney's handling of the pandemic, and are hoping to capitalize on the anger in Alberta. Here's part of an ad from the Liberal candidate in Calgary Skyview. Premier Kenney has navigated this COVID-19 pandemic far better than the federal government has. And when it comes to getting our country back on track, the federal conservatives can learn a lot from our UCP cousin. Our Mike LeCouture is with the conservatives. Mike, how is Aaron O'Toole handling this? Donna, earlier today, Aaron O'Toole repeatedly refused to comment on how Alberta Premier Jason Kenney is handling the COVID-19 situation in his province. During his press conference at a curling rink, he slid around multiple questions about how, as recently as last Sunday, the federal Conservative leader praised his provincial counterpart's management of the pandemic. Despite Kenney now admitting he got it wrong, as he declared a public health emergency Wednesday, O'Toole would only say he supports province's efforts to try and fight COVID-19, each time turning it back to a criticism of Liberal leader Justin Trudeau and his management of the pandemic. Donna? All right, Mike LeCouture in Truro, Nova Scotia, thanks. Well, COVID cases are rising fast in Saskatchewan, too. Starting tomorrow, masks will be mandatory in all indoor public spaces. And a proof of vaccination policy starts October 1st. People will have to show they are immunized or show a recent negative test. It will apply to all non-essential businesses and event venues. If you are unvaccinated and living in Saskatchewan, it's now time to get your shot. The vast majority of Saskatchewan people that have done the right thing, quite frankly, they are tired of those that have chose not to. Saskatchewan is the last province in Western Canada to implement a version of a vaccine passport. We are in Brampton, where the medical officer of health for this region warned today more people will die of COVID-19 here unless vaccinations increase. 77% of eligible people in Peel region have had both doses. He wants that to rise to 90%. Now, politically, Brampton and the region around here is packed with voters who aren't loyal to any particular party. They are vote switchers. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, explains why that makes this fertile ground for all the parties. David? Donna, let me show you the 905, the region we're talking about. It's a horseshoe-shaped region around Toronto, 30 seats. Most of them are Liberal Red. But beyond the border of the 905, a solid wall of Conservative Blue. And that is the choice in the 905. It really is either Liberals. Here in Oakville, you've knocked on thousands and thousands of doors and made thousands more phone calls. Keep it up! or Conservatives. Far too many people across the region are trapped in gridlock every day. Far too many people, especially young people, are priced out of the housing market. No other party has ever had success in the region. Ed Broadbent is the only New Democrat to win here in the last 60 years. Now, while the 25 seats in Toronto are usually reliably liberal, and the 34 seats in Alberta are reliably conservative, the 30 ridings in the 905 have often changed hands over the years. That electoral volatility, combined with the sheer number of seats in the region, has given the 905 an outsized influence on our national politics. And that's why we're going to pay so much attention to this region on election night, and specifically to the ridings on the borders. Ridings like Milton, where in 2019, Liberal Olympic kayaker Adam Vancouverton beat Conservative Lisa Ray. Or also on the northern border near Vaughan, two ridings, 
home to the largest concentration of Italian Canadian voters. Or where you are, Donna, in Brampton. Five ridings, huge South Asian population, all went conservative in 2011 when Stephen Harper won his majority, all snapped back red to Justin Trudeau when he won in 2019. One final tidbit about the 905 and the GTA, there's never been a prime minister in our history to hold any one of these ridings. So if the MP for Durham, Aaron O'Toole, can win this thing, well, that'll be a first. Donna. Okay, lots at play there, David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks. The cost of housing is a big issue here, as it is in so many places across the country. The average cost of a home in the GTA is more than a million dollars. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh is in the region today, making his case on how he'd solve the problem. Robin Gill is with the NDP in the last days of the campaign. Robin? Donna, while in the GTA, the NDP leader is hammering away at the affordable housing crisis, given that Toronto is one of the most expensive real estate markets in the country. The NDP leader wants to stop the flipping of homes and big developers making big profits. It's the same message he's been hitting at since the start of the election. You've got to get that pressure out of the market, get that big money out of the market. And we've got two ways to do that. Uh, one, a foreign buyer's tax. Second, change the capital gains that would discourage the existing incentive in property flipping. Singh insists that there will be no tax on primary residences despite the skyrocketing prices in this country. Okay, Robin in Toronto, thank you. We take you inside Brampton's only hospital. Coming up, how health workers already pushed to the brink before the pandemic are struggling now. You're looking at the Credit River here in Brampton. We are on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We'll be right back. Brampton, Ontario is home to about 600,000 people. It is the ninth largest city in Canada, home to lots of essential workers, shift workers and new immigrants. And there is only one hospital. Brampton Civic Hospital was already bursting at the seams before the pandemic hit. Now it's at the breaking point. Jeff Semple takes us inside. Staff at Brampton Civic Hospital are constantly on the move. This emergency physician is juggling 16 patients, only a couple of whom have COVID-19. The usual illness that we saw uh, dip during the pandemic, those illnesses are coming back. Patients, particularly children, arriving with flu-like illness. While others, like this 50-year-old woman with an advanced lung infection, avoided coming to hospital during the pandemic. She's now rushed to the ICU. We're seeing volumes there like we've never seen really in history, actually. And within the ICU, I think we're starting to see those COVID cases rise. This hospital was one of the hardest hit by the first waves of the pandemic. The region, home to a large number of immigrants and essential workers, had Ontario's most COVID cases per capita. And in a city the size of Vancouver, more than 600,000 residents, this is the only hospital. Even prior to the pandemic, Brampton Civic was one of the busiest hospitals in Ontario. Its average hospital occupancy before COVID-19 was nearly 109%. We knew we had to do something. This Brampton City Councillor moved a motion last year, days before Canada's first confirmed case of COVID-19, to declare a health care emergency. So Mr. Mayor, the motion carries unanimously. We are so stretched and our capacity was so overwhelmed. And COVID has only um, expanded that uh, tenfold. Brampton is one of Canada's fastest growing cities, but healthcare funding has failed to keep pace. When the pandemic hit, the hospital found itself caring for the most COVID patients with the fewest hospital beds. It was not uncommon that I would see someone who was dying and an end of life in the hallway. This doctor left the hospital in April after 15 years. Even prior to the pandemic, staff treated more than 4,000 patients a year in hospital hallways. Before elections, politicians, I remember, would come to our hospital and hold press conferences about ending hallway medicine, but the action uh, never really happened. And the story of Brampton, I feel, is largely the story of many people who are new immigrants to Canada, who faced uh, inequities in the healthcare system, which is grossly underfunded. 
Last spring, Ontario's Premier Doug Ford announced a hospital expansion that will include 250 new hospital beds and a second emergency department for Brampton. But Donna, construction on that not expected to begin until the year 2023. And even with those additions, Brampton will remain well below the provincial average when it comes to hospital beds per capita. So many promises made and not kept. Jeff Simple, thanks. Still ahead, claims by a former top soldier accused of sexual misconduct don't pass a paternity test. Global News has learned exclusive new details about the allegations of sexual misconduct facing former Chief of the Defence Staff, retired General Jonathan Vance. DNA testing shared with Global News found that Vance all but certainly fathered a child with Major Kelly Brennan years after he said their relationship had ended. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson has the exclusive story. He fathered two children with me. That's Major Kelly Brennan, disclosing for the first time publicly a belief she's held privately for years. Global News has obtained the results of two paternity tests taken by former Chief of the Defence Staff Jonathan Vance and two of Brennan's children. One test found the probability Vance fathered the child is 99.99991%. That contradicts Vance's past statements that his sexual relationship with Brennan ended in 2001, when both were still posted to Canadian Forces Base Gagetown in New Brunswick. Nothing since then, since Gagetown? No. You're no. sure? You 100% sure, John? What's that? Are you 100% sure? Paternity testing for a second child ruled out Vance as being the father in that case. Global News is not disclosing the names or ages of the children to protect their identities, but both were born after 2001. Neither Vance nor his lawyer responded to multiple attempts by Global News to seek comment for this story. But we did ask Vance in February about the paternity allegations. So you're not father? I am not. You're not father? I don't even know who these people are. Vance has denied all allegations of inappropriate behavior. Military police opened an investigation into the allegations of sexual misconduct made by two subordinate women who came forward about Vance to Global News. Vance cannot be tried for any military charges related to sexual misconduct because his rank prevents him from being prosecuted in a military court. It is absolutely unacceptable that because of rank, certain people be exempt uh, from the law. Experts say there is also a potential national security concern. Secrets could be exploited for blackmail by enemy foreign powers. Vance has been charged with obstructing justice and is scheduled to appear in court Friday. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, Ottawa. A Brampton mother's loss in the pandemic. Up next, could her son's death have been prevented? One of Canada's biggest warehouse and distribution hubs is here in Brampton, Ontario. And during the pandemic, thousands of essential workers in Peel region kept essentials moving. One of those people was Harman Deep Singh. He was 36. He died in Brampton Civic Hospital of COVID-19. His family says he fell through the cracks and community advocates say his death was preventable. Farah Nasser has his story. Manmeet Oberoi grieves for her son, Harman Deep Singh. It's his loss, and he was not ready for it. The Canadian Tire team leader died in May after a short battle with COVID-19. He was just 36 years old. I don't know how Harman Deep must have felt the night he spent in the ER, right? And the final breath that he took. Oberoi, her husband, and their son tested positive for COVID-19 in April. They were vaccinated, but Harmandeep didn't yet qualify. Asthmatic with worsening symptoms, he went to Brampton Civic Hospital. Oberoi says her son was turned away twice. Isolate yourself, take Tylenol, cold and flu. After two days, he really felt bad. He spent his five to six hours in the ER. The first thing nurse told us, there are so many people before him, don't know how many are going to die. 
Discharged with puffers and anxiety medication, Harmandeep died 30 hours later. If Brampton had more hospitals, more hospital beds, you think your son could possibly still be Absolutely. alive? Absolutely. The hospital isn't commenting, citing patient privacy, but in a statement says they're undertaking a care review. When Obroy and her family fell ill, Brampton's COVID-19 test positivity reached above 20 percent, double the province's rate of 10.5. This worker's advocate says thousands of essential employees like Harman Deep put their lives in danger daily. We had some of the biggest workplace outbreaks here, um, and instead of getting services that we needed, we were being blamed. For, for having high cases. Is it fair to say that you think Brampton was left behind? 100% and I think it's been left behind for decades now. Um, we are a huge racialized community and I think that has a lot to do with it. And so there are so many people here that can't access proper rights or services or programs. Hmm. In one of the community's hardest hit areas, Samrith Kaur sees inequality firsthand. A lot of people did have a hate towards Brampton. Fearing another lockdown, she worries her community will be overlooked yet again. They are living by hand, hand to mouth. They can't just work from home. Given heightened risk factors in communities like Brampton, Oberoi feels those in power federally should have done more to respond sooner. They know what's going on. You know, if they don't know, then they don't deserve to be in the government. They don't deserve to be our leaders. The day her son died was the same day he would have qualified for his first dose. This election, that's never far from her thoughts. Farah Nasser, Global News, Brampton. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Fries, and we leave you tonight with more images from Brampton, an incredibly diverse city. People from at least 170 different cultures have settled here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again on Monday. We'll have extensive coverage on election night here on Global. For now, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.